Welcome, dear friends, a very joyous and restorative Sabbath to you. I want to thank God for the safe preservation of the Lord through this past week, for how he's been fighting for us and how his labors of love bring us to yet another joyous occasion to sit in his presence, to receive of his bounties, to be filled with his spirit. Would you turn your thoughts with me, please, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 11. 2 Corinthians 9.11, the Bible says, Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. Listen to those words again, friends. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. What a special blessing, friends. As we look around, we see that in everything the bounties of the Lord have just been showered and endowed upon us so richly, so abundantly, truly, friends, so unspeakably, as the Bible tells us, there's not even room enough to keep it. No wonder the psalmist in Psalm 116 verse 7 speaks to himself saying, Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Friends, what a blessing it is to reflect, to reminisce, to count our blessings and to recognize how richly we are a favored people, dear friends. And so the writer of Corinthians, Paul, reminds us that because God has been doing so wondrously, because God has been doing so bountifully in every area of our life, it should cause us to offer thanksgiving to the Lord God who is always, always there for his people. I pray, friends, that you would take time this blessed Sabbath day as the Lord surrounds you with the memorials and reminders of his precious faithfulness, that your heart will be lifted up with heavenly gladness that would swell the heart of God with joy to see his people love and celebrate his goodness. Join us as we pray, dear friends. Dear Heavenly Father, help us, Lord God. You do so much for us. We thank you so little. Help us to take time. Help us to push life aside and to take time to give God glory who is faithful beyond measure. I thank you, God, for my brothers and sisters. I know, Lord, all of us are going through different trials or circumstances, difficulties, challenges. But we give you glory that in the midst of it all, you have offered us a peace, assurance, a consolation, a wonderful, wonderful peace the world cannot give, the world does not understand. God, I thank you for the gift of this Sabbath, its restorative abundance, and the great works you seek to accomplish in us, through us, for us today. I thank you, God, for your child who you have prepared with the equipment of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for the word that you want to enlighten us with. We pray, Father, that you would please renew us afresh with your divine presence and draw our hearts far away from the cares, the presses, and the worries of this world, that we will be in your presence and that as we walk into the coming week, may the world see that we have been with Jesus. Thank you, God. Possess us afresh. Please, with yourself, we give thee glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day. King or sleeping, thy presence, my light. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true end. I ever. Thou my great 
Thou in me dwelling, and I one with Thee. I, King of heaven, my victory is won. May I reach heaven's joys, Son, heart of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision, O ruler of all. All right, we are, we're going to get into God's Word. We're in the second part of our, our series on the health message. And like our series on apologetics, not an easy series to do. Um, you know, the health message speaks to a lot of what we are and who we are, um, especially as Americans in a land of excess. Um, the idea of temperance is um, oftentimes very difficult. So uh, as we as we begin to talk about the health message, you know, know that I, I'm not it's never an, uh, um, me trying to pound anyone or anything, but it, it is a part of what makes us who we are as Adventists. And um, so it is really important that we that we study the health message. Um, a little slow uptake on our slides. All right, so our scripture reading um, for the message, a little different than what uh, Donnie read earlier, is going to come from Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 5. Proverbs chapter 3, starting at verse 5. We're going to read 5 through 8. Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. I like what uh, the the wise man says in verse 7. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. There's a promise. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to your bones. It shall be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. Our message this Sabbath, the second part of our series, is entitled, Trusting God is Healthy. Trusting God is Healthy. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to once again study your word. I ask in a special way, Lord, that you just make me a nail on the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. But upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Lord, there's no reason for Eric Walsh to be seen or heard. We need a word from you. So, Lord, we ask that you speak now by the power of the Holy Ghost. Fill this place with your presence. Guard it with angels. Bind the devil and cast him and his minions far away. That, Lord, we might meditate fully upon your word. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to go, in order to make our point, we're going to go to a, a, one of my favorite Bible stories in Mark chapter 5. And I won't break this down as much as I normally would so we can get to some other stuff. But it is one of the most uh, telling stories of the New Testament. In Mark chapter 5 and verse 25, the Bible says, And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, 
and had spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather, the Bible says, she did what? She grew worse. So here's a woman that based on the Levitical law of the Old Testament, she has an issue of blood, meaning she has a problem with menstruation where it will not stop. That based on the law of the time, it made her perpetually for 12 years unclean, which meant she was not supposed to go around anyone, be around anyone. If she was married, when the condition came upon her, it would her, oftentimes the husband would actually leave. This would have been one of the worst situations she could have been in. It would have left her ostracized and alone. 12 years. She went to the best medical minds in Jerusalem. And of course, they, don't, they didn't understand medicine like we do today. But still, there, there was nothing they could do. But here's what's sad. They were happy to take her money. So now, after 12 years, probably barely able to get nourishment and to live, to sustain life from a financial standpoint, she is growing physically worse in her health. And at the same time, she is running out of resources. The spirit of prophecy tells us that she had gotten to the end of the rope in a sense that she had started the process of giving up. But then she heard about this man named Jesus. And in verse 27, when she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. The spirit of prophecy tells us that she had tried to meet him a couple other times before. She could never get close enough to him. She had resigned that she might not ever meet him, but he happened to pass by where she was. She would have been physically weak, church. She would not have been able to push and shove like some of us can. But the Bible says that when that happened, she came in the press behind and she touched just his garment. And here's the logic she had. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. What a powerful story of trusting God. She didn't even want his attention. In fact, she didn't think he would even pay her mind. He was so uh, under the, the deluge of the, of the throng of people around him. She figured, I won't even try and bother him. He'd never hear my voice if I could just touch his clothes. She trusted the healing power of Jesus. Verse 29 says, and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. She touched him and instantaneously she could feel deep down in her lower abdomen something shifted. She knew immediately that she was healed. She tried to slip away from the crowd quietly and not make too much of a fuss. She'd gotten what she needed and she was ready to retreat and go home and start her life. But Jesus would not let her get away so easily. In verse 30, the Bible says, and Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Can you imagine? There's a mob of people trying to get at Jesus, people sticking out their hands, trying to fall at his feet. People are just throwing um, requests at him. But Jesus stops at the touch of faith. He says, virtue, goodness has gone out of me. You see, when you trust God, you tap into his goodness. It flows naturally to those who trust him. And it does not mean every time you get exactly what you want. But what you do get is his attention. He said, who touched my clothes? And we know which disciple responded uh, by Luke. It was Peter. You, you would have probably figured that out even if it wasn't written. You know, Peter is the one who informed Mark to read, write the book of Mark. So he probably didn't put his name in there because he's always in the mix. And so he didn't say anything here. But Luke tells on him, it was Peter. And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and sayest thou who touched me. What are you crazy, Jesus? Look at all the people around you. How could you ask? Who touched you? Everybody's trying to touch you. And we're going to see that one of the lessons of this 
of this of this story is everybody trying to touch Jesus does not have faith in Jesus. Verse 32, and he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. So he finds her. He knows who she is. He looks at her. And now she realizes she can't hide. Verse 33, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. She's fearful. She's trembling. She's whole. Even the anemia, the chronic anemia she would have had for 12 years, the, 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 the amount of red blood cells in her vessels now, in her blood vessels, would have shot back up to normal. She was fully whole, fully strong. And yet, when she is able to speak to Jesus, she trembles. She fell down and told him everything. And I love what Jesus says to her in verse 34. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. We're going to get back to this at the, towards the end of the message, but notice that Jesus does not say, it's a good thing you reached out and touched my clothes because that saved you. It wasn't superstition. It was her faith her trust in God that made her whole. That is the lesson. Now, so trust in God is one of the key components of being a Christian, obviously. But because we're talking about the health message, it is one of the key components of our health message is to trust God. And that's why that story sticks out. It, she, she went to the physicians of her time. They could not really do anything for her. In fact, they extracted from her and gave her nothing. But when she trusted God, her whole life turned around. Now watch this. So there are eight laws of health. You guys have probably all seen this before. We use the an acronym uh, New Start. And normally this is a community-facing uh, uh, thing that we do. So we start with nutrition and exercise. But I would venture to say that when you're dealing with the church, you almost have to flip this on its head. And you start with trust in God. You see, as I talked about in the first message on the health message, um, the purpose of the health message isn't to lower cholesterol or to reverse diabetes. Those are beautiful side effects of our health message. The purpose of our health message is clarity of mind and content of character. This body is not going to heaven with you. The body we go to heaven with will be glorified. The scripture says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be uh, made new. We will be uh, made whole. We'll be glorified. Right? So it's the tr what you do take to heaven with you is your trust in God. And so this is why I start here. Because the truth of the matter is, none of the other points of our health message really mean anything if you don't have this one. You can be physically fit and in faith weak. Look at what the Bible says. And we're going to speak to how important trust in God is, not only from the, the, the vantage point of the health message, but also prophetically. There are two reasons why trust in God are critical. In the chapter of Luke, uh, chapter 21, where Jesus outlines end time events, this is one of the most startling statements he gives in Luke 21 and verse 26. He says, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken, which is a reference really to uh, the, uh, the, 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 the seventh pl uh, plague of the last plagues. But it also speaks to what's going on every single day. What is the number one killer in the United States of America? Heart disease. And the number one reason someone visits a medical office is anxiety. The prophecy is in America is literally fulfilled if you just look at, if you were able to just do a search of all of the medical records in America, you'd find that people die most of heart disease and they suffer most with anxiety. Men's hearts failing them for fear. The prophecy is exactly fulfilled. It is a statement of the time we live in. And part of the reason that this is happening is because we live in a world, as I said last message, where God has been extracted from society and has been replaced with theories like evolution. 
So you have nothing to trust in. Right? There are people who worship their ancestors. But according to evolution, your ancestors go all the way back to monkeys and slugs and amoebas and stuff. What good is an amoeba going to do you when you're in trouble? I've never seen an amoeba come swooping in to help somebody change a tire or anything. Men's hearts are failing them for fear because the world is in a chaotic state. I, and let me tell you something. I, when I grew up in, the, in, in this faith, uh, you know, went to church, at uh, faith church in Hartford. And, and I mean, I remember hearing these messages and the world seemed crazy then. Let me tell you something. It is crazier now. I'm going to give you an example. Because you see, we live in a stressful world. The reason we need to trust God is because stress is bad for you. Stress will kill you regardless of how good your diet is. I'm going to say that again. You can eat every broccoli, carrot, even beets. You can eat them all and flavor them with ginger and turmeric if you want. But if you do not trust God, if you're not able to allay fear and deal with stress, your body internally responds to stress in such a powerful way that stress all by itself can kill you. That's why folks sometimes say, well, this person was vegetarian. Ask what was going on in their life. So we live in a stressful world. And I'm going to give you some examples of global stress. This week, um, we saw that there's an, a, a potential escalation of the war in Europe. And, we, you know, everyone in the world is really beginning to panic. The, 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 the domino effect of this war around fuel prices and, not, and then inflation. And then the, the, um, uh, the, the, the fact that so many have been displaced from Eastern Europe. Uh, is, 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 is raising the levels. We saw the President of the United States give a speech in front of the United Nations that some argue might actually stoke the flames of war rather than calm them. I don't know enough to know. I'm only glad I know that man cannot stop the time. Only God can. I started hearing people say, listen, there's going to be a nuclear war. The world's going to come to an end. I said, nah, 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 nah. My God is in control. We saw natural disasters like never before. This is the flood in Pakistan. A whole a lake, glaciers melted so fast that there is what they say, and, and it caused the, the waters to run down and, and, and cover an entire area. I mean, some of the pictures are pretty impressive as to what's going on in Pakistan. And we, you know, these stories hit the news like this was about a week and a half ago, whatever it was, and you hear it on the news, you might contemplate it for five minutes, and guess what? You forget all about it. Like, what do I need to get from the grocery store, right? You start thinking about your own life, your own problems, while people are left in this. But it wasn't just Pakistan, it was Kentucky. Worst floods in eastern Kentucky in, in many, many years. It wasn't just the floods in Kentucky, as Matthew 24 says, that there would be earthquakes in diverse places. We saw a, a pretty massive earthquake in Mexico. One of the most interesting things about this uh, this earthquake is they said there was a tsunami of a desert tsunami. I said, "What is a desert tsunami? The very sand in a desert." Earthquake, massive earthquake. But not just that. As we were as 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 Elder Dimitri uh, prayed about the 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 these, these hurricanes. Fiona has already done a great deal of damage. I'm in contact with some people in Bermuda, and it was 100 miles off the coast of Bermuda, but still, they got pretty strong winds. It obviously wreaked havoc in Puerto Rico and in the island it hit before Puerto Rico. And, you know, the, the, the shame of, of the situation is that our country is wealthy enough to go into Puerto Rico and fix some of these problems once and for all. And I'm praying that we will do that. But these natural disasters, because there's a, there's a storm right behind it, uh, the Hermine that's coming, and now they're, they're worried it's going to cross Cuba and then possibly hit t somewhere between Miami and Tampa. So you're seeing this again, and we've seen this before, where you have rapid-fire hurricanes. It's not new. I lived in Florida. They, sometimes in Florida, it's like every week there's a hurricane. And what this has embarked upon is a new stressor for many people in America and around the world. And that stressor has everything to do with global warming. In fact, here's what's ironic. The people in the world most claiming that the world is coming to an end are no longer Adventists. It's climate people. Y'all missed that one. They're not afraid. Look at what they're Time is running out. 
warning. And they're saying, listen, they've made movies the day after tomorrow. Like it's, it's, it's coming right now. Now we're called crazy when we say the world is coming to an end. But they're all on it. Like, listen, the world is coming to an end. And unless we change all of these behaviors and fix all of these different things, the world is going to come to an end. California has already announced that by 2030 or 2033 or something like that, every car sold in California has to be an electric vehicle. You're going to see radical changes in the world. Because I'm telling you, if you've ever been to see how many cars there are in California, I want to figure out where all of them are going to plug in to get electricity. And if you know anything about the grid in California, if they all plug in at the same time, nobody's going to have electricity. The world is changing and it's stressful. When you think about it, they're telling you that your children, we, we're, we're not going to have a world to leave to the children. The, 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 our budget deficits are so great. The, the, the national debts, so many trillions of dollars. We've ruined everything for our children and our grandchildren. And that causes you to worry. And, and it, uh, it hits our pockets directly when you look at what inflation has done. A cup of coffee in 1970 was 25 cents. Today it's a dollar and eighty-five, and I don't think they—I they, don't think they um, averaged in Starbucks because it would be higher. But here's the thing: wages have not kept up with inflation. The amount that people actually make in this country has not grown this fast. I want you to get what I'm saying. This creates a level of stress on the individual that is quantifiable, and I—I I think back to my single mother raising three boys by herself, uh, trying to figure out how to make ends meet. The number of months where there was more month than there was money. And the stress that she must have carried trying to figure out how she would feed all of us. This is the reality of what stress is and does. So much so that America Despite the, the, all of the talk about the pandemic, we missed a very terrible epidemic that happened during the pandemic. We missed one. And that is the number of drug overdose death, uh, drug overdose deaths in the United States. Did you know that in a 12-month period in the United States, over a hundred thousand people overdosed on drugs? And let me tell you, because when I studied addiction medicine at Loma Linda I, 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 at the vet, Veteran Hospital. One of the things that I found fascinating is that many people do drugs as a way to self-medicate. Literally, they're doing drugs in order to, to, to manage pain and trauma that is unresolved or to escape from a life they don't want. And here, here's the irony. In the wealthiest country, some argue, in all of human history, the United States, that you would have people so desperate that not only are they overdosing like this, the suicide rates have gone through the roof. Even in groups of people who traditionally do not have high suicide rates. Stress. Men's hearts failing them for fear. So we self-medicate to try and numb the pain. We try and drink our way out of it or, or sniff our way out of it, snort our way out of it, shoot up our way out of it, take the pills to get us out of it. But there is no escaping this thing. The reason trust in God is the very foundation of the health message is because it takes a trust in God to understand why it is that there is so much pain in this world in the first place. An understanding of the great controversy. If you don't get that, then it almost seems reasonable to self-medicate. The drug overdose deaths is one of the biggest challenges we face. And I, I've said this before here, but while I was working at the Veterans Hospital doing addiction medicine, one of the things I found most helpful was one of the statements that they would chant at the meetings. And it was this statement here. God made the human heart so big only he can fill it. If you don't trust God, if you don't have a connection to him, there is a God-sized hole in your heart that cannot be filled by the things of this world. All, the, all of the drugs, all of the alcohol, all of the parties and, 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 and dance night outs, uh, all of the Bentleys and, 
and, and private jets, the fancy clothes and jewelry, none of that will fill the hole. It's part of the reason why even some of the wealthiest people in this country succumb to anxiety, depression, and even suicide. Trust in God lays the foundation of our health message. It is a relationship with Christ, and there is power in believing. I'm going to give you an example. I often see people use this example when they talk about our health message. I, I figure I'd, I'd throw it in there, and that's the placebo effect. You ever heard of this? The power of the mind? What we know about the placebo effect is that literally if you give 100, you take 200 people, split them into two groups of 100, you give one of them a sugar pill, and you other one, give the other one real medicine, up to 4 or 5%, some studies up to 7 or 9% of the people who get the sugar pill will get the same benefit as the people who took the real medicine. It's called a placebo effect. There's also a nocebo effect, which is the reverse of that, but I won't get into that one. In the placebo effect, you, if you believe that you are getting the medicine, even if you are not, it is the brain's ability to turn off your response to disease that is, uh, that is put into effect. So if you think you're getting a medicine, it literally sometimes, and most of the time what it's related to is pain. The pain receptors in the brain, which are under your control, can actually go away. That is the power of the mind and of thought. The spirit of prophecy speaks heavily of this, that we must have positive thought. So this is what happens. So you have a placebo effect. This is in treatment of asthma, right? Someone's having an asthma attack. They give them real albuterol. That's the medicine we give. It's a bronchodilator, beta-2 agonist. It opens up the, um, the, the, the uh, alveoli and the lung passages so that you breathe better. The people who got the placebo almost felt, and this is how they felt after they got it, this is how they felt, they almost felt as good as the people who got the real medicine. You see that? The, one of them got acupuncture that wasn't real, and they even did better than the placebo. And they, they were saying in the article that that's because if the, if the, if the person giving the care is kind and compassionate, and speaks nicely to you, you feel better. Isn't that, is that, isn't that amazing? And there's so many mean people when you go to see us in the medical field. It's a shame. And no intervention that stays on here. I want to show you something. This is how the people felt. But look at this. This is what actually happened. The change in FEV, um, and this is how much air they could breathe out and um, um, uh, forced a volume of, of breath out. Look at it. what actually happened, though, is that the, none of the three things actually worked, only the albuterol did. What changed is how they felt about it. Are you getting this? So their lung didn't actually change. The, the, you know, the, the more objective measure shows you that, but how they felt did. The reason that we trust in God is not simply to get some placebo effect, because I'm gonna show you that, that the, place, the trusting in God is a real effect. It is the treatment. But it is because it puts your mind in a position to be healthy. When the three Hebrew boys were in front of Nebuchadnezzar and facing the fiery furnace, do you remember what they said? Nebuchadnezzar said, listen, if you don't go, if you don't bow, I'm going to throw you into this furnace. Their response was powerful. It's okay. We'll go into the furnace because the God we serve can deliver us. And basically their point was, even if he chooses not to deliver us, we will stay faithful because we know he has the ability to deliver us. That's enough. Why is that enough? Because they trusted God. When you trust God, even when life does not go the way you want it to, you have this assurance that you can trust that his love for you is greater than whatever's come to you. And if he leaves you in it, he leaves you in it in love because the three Hebrew boys would never have met the pre-incarnate Christ in the fiery furnace if they had trusted uh, what Nebuchadnezzar said and watched what all the other people from Israel did and had bowed. I want to submit to you, trusting in God is good for you because it is how we meet Jesus many times. So what does the Bible say about all this? Well, Proverbs 17 and verse 22, our scripture reading today that Donnie read, this is a powerful verse. It says, a merry heart doeth good like a what? Like a medicine. This is what we just saw in the placebo effect. But a broken spirit dries the bones. A merry heart. Let me tell you, you know what's, what's, what's surprising to me? 
is when I meet unhappy and miserable Christians. I don't understand it. I'm happy because I know Jesus. Like, I'm always happy. Even when things go bad, it doesn't take long for me to start being happy again because I think about Jesus. And because I have Jesus in my life, I can get sad, I can get down, but knowing Jesus makes me happy. You know what else it does? It makes me treat people nicely. I want to treat people nicely because Jesus has treated me most nicely. Are you getting what I'm saying? My relationship with Christ tells me that although I deserved to die, he took my place on the cross and it was my sin that held him there. So how can I treat you poorly? Now, you know what's sad? And the Lord is leading me to say this, but what's sad sometimes is sometimes we, we're roughest with the people we are supposed to love the most. I mean, like my brothers and I, like we, we fight, you know, we, we were rougher on each other. Than, but if somebody on the street, you know, we'd be, you know, we'd be nicer to them. So is there something scientifically to trust in God, to church attendance, to being a part of the family of God that is good for you? The science is pretty much overwhelming. Religious faith can lead to positive mental benefits, writes a Stanford anthropologist. Now, Stanford is not a Christian institution for anyone who knows anything about Stanford, but it, this is what they're saying. Forbes magazine, again, not a Christian um, 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 magazine says, or, or, or journal says, science says religion is good for your health. Now, that's not what the world tells you. The world tells you the complete opposite, that if you are religious, it's be, you're ignorant and you're you know, foolish and backwards. But here's what the article says. I want to read this quote from the article. There is ample reason to believe that faith in a higher power is associated with health and in a positive way. Researchers at the Mayo Clinic, one of the best medical institutions in the country, Said, uh, concluded most studies have shown that religious involvement and spirituality are associated with better health outcomes, including greater longevity, coping skills, and health-related quality of life, even during terminal illness, and less anxiety, depression, and suicide. Several studies have shown that addressing the spiritual needs of the patient may enhance recovery from illness. My mother, when she was dying the painful death that cancer gave her was still joyous. You know what we did that whole last weekend with my mother as she, before she died? She died on like that late Sunday night, Monday morning. We sang hymns the whole time she was awake. She was joyous. My friend, one of my good friends that I went to medical school with was her oncologist. And he couldn't believe Never on the oncology floor. And that was a cancer hospital on that floor, the floor where they put people who are terminal. Never before had he heard songs of praise coming out of the room. When you trust God, it gives you a peace when the world would say you should be anxious. So, more specifically, health benefits of the Christian faith. This is from an uh, um, online site, The Human Journey. And they start out by talking about, and I even put the references here, how religion is actually viewed. So this is a U from the UK, and they quote uh, these two things, but this is how they start the article to make their point. Religion is for the hesitant, the guilt-ridden, the excessive, excessively timid, those lacking clear convictions with, the, with, with which to face life, said a standard British textbook on psychiatry until 1969. They viewed being religious in this British psychiatry textbook, as if, if you were religious, as if something was wrong with you. The implication is clear. Faith selects the weak and is probably bad for your health. That's what the medical establishment in the, that wrote that textbook says. Sigmund Freud, how many of you heard of Sigmund Freud? Pretty much all of us have heard of Sigmund Freud. I'm not a big fan of Freud. He said, religion is a neurosis. I remember being at Oakwood, taking psychology. I was so glad I was at a Christian school when I took psychology so that all of this could be broken down and explained properly. Because when I took it in, uh, later on in medical school and at other schools, they weren't nearly as so kind to religion. They sided with Freud, even though Freud has been debunked on a number of things that he said. So the article def to defend faith says this. Is there a link between faith and health? Evidence from over 1,200 studies. How many studies? 
1,200 studies and 400 reviews has shown an association between faith and a number of positive health benefits, including protection from illness, coping with illness, and faster recovery from it. Of the studies reviewed in the definitive analysis, 81% showed that faith was beneficial and only 4% showed that there was any harm whatsoever. And one of the things that they say in the notes is that this has to do with those who don't believe in blood transfusions or don't believe in any kind of medical treatment at all. But then no studies, it could be harmful. The raw data from such large studies show a significant benefit in mortality for those involved in organized religion. Don't miss this. For instance, one study followed 21,204 representative American adults over nine years and correlated death rates with religious activity in a large range of other data. Look at this. Income and education had surprisingly little impact, but those who attended church regularly had a life expectancy, a life expectancy seven years longer than those who did not. Now look at this next line. For black people in America, the benefit was 14 years. The researchers attributed the benefit to more protective relationships, including marriage and to health behaviors. They don't want to say what I'm going to say. And that is, there's also the component that when you trust God, you get to leave things at the foot of the cross. There are stressors that happen, difficulties and challenges that come to life. And there's something that lifts from you when you're able to go on your knees and call on the name of the Lord. Something shifts. And a weight is often lifted and you realize that, yes, I might be powerless over what's going on, but I serve a God who is all powerful. So what about mental health? So I have a picture here of Bill Maher. I talk about him all the time. Bill Maher is one of the great atheists in the United States. In fact, he he on his show on HBO, he he um, he uh, celebrates the fact that because of the documentary relig uh, religious list that he made and other things that he's done, that he's actually, a he's actually caused people to leave Christianity, Judaism, Islam, but mainly Christianity, and become atheists. He's proud of it, right? He says here, Bill Maher mocks Sunday school, claims churches should pay taxes for making children stupid. This is the, this is the environment we are in as Christians. For those of you who don't think there'll be a time of trouble coming, Understand that you could say this. You couldn't go on television and say this about any other group of people. I want you to think about that for a second. You could not go on television and say stuff like this by anybody else. You'd be canceled. Look at this. Benefit for mental health. In the popular imagination, religion commonly underlies florid mental illness such as psychosis. In reality, though, religiosity has been shown to protect against psychosis. And patients who use religion to cope had better insight with uh, and were more compliant with medication. In the majority of studies, religious involvement is correlated with well-being, happiness and life satisfaction, hope and optimism, purpose and meaning in life, higher self-esteem, better adaptation to bereavement, greater social support and less loneliness, lower rates of depression and faster recovery from depression, lower rates of suicide and fewer positive attitudes towards suicide, less anxiety, less psychosis, and fewer psychotic tendencies, lower rates of alcohol and drug abuse, less delinquency and criminal activity, greater marital stability and satisfaction. When they look at it, being religious is actually good for your health. It's no wonder the devil is attacking organized religion the way he is. I saw Jay-Z interviewed on one of the, um, it was like hip-hop, uh, um, online interviews on his morning shows, I think, and he mocked people. Jay Z, for those of you who don't know, is one of the, arguably the greatest rapper of all time, married to Beyonce, highly influential. And he said that you basically he said they asked him, "Do you believe in religion or do you believe in God or something?" He said, "He said, man, I would never believe in organized religion." He basically said, "I would never be so foolish to do that." There is an attack on what we have here now. And they can't openly attack just yet, but trust me, church, there are forces at work that are going to change the way religion is viewed so much that it will be open season on anyone who calls the Bible the word of God. Does it benefit mental health? It absolutely does. 
This is the conclusion of the largest literature review and is endorsed by a former president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. This is what the, the president, former president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists said. He laments the lack of attention given to, for, to the strong evidence. Look at this. He says, for anything other than religion and spirituality, governments and health providers would be doing their utmost to promote it. You know what the psychiatrist is saying? That if you found this much benefit in eating oranges, they would be telling everyone to eat oranges. But because it's religion, because it's Christianity, let's just be honest, they won't. And unfortunately, the health of the people is going to suffer because somehow the world wants to teach you that you can erase God from your life and have no consequences. You see, in a world of stress, trusting God is healthy. And so there's something, we'll talk more about as we go through, something called, I do call it a, a concept I have called the stress equation. Um, and the stress equation um, is that stress equals demands minus resources, right? The stress in your life is equal to the demands you have on you minus the resources you have to combat those demands. The reason Christianity is so powerful is because God gives proper resources. And we'll talk more about them in a minute. One of them is just the fellowship you get from coming to church. That's why Paul says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together because it's good for you spiritually and physically. But what the devil does is he wants to give you false resources. And as you go through the rest of the, the, the health message, what you realize is you're combating the false resources that the devil has. Alcohol. People think if they drink alcohol, they'll sleep better. It's actually the opposite. Right? I could go all the way through all the different things. How we eat. Everything we do is a resource either for good or for bad. And what stress does is creates inflammation. Look at this study. This is the Journal of International Medicine Research. It says chronic stress is a critical risk factor for atherosclerosis. What is atherosclerosis? That's how the plaques are formed on the, on the arteries in your body. And when they form around your heart or, or, or going up your neck, um, like in your um, jugglers and, and um, carotid arteries, those uh, plaques eventually either close off so you don't get much blood, or they break off, plug somewhere else, and you got a heart attack or a stroke. Sh chronic stress mitigates this. It causes this. So, I, I always joke that, you know, growing up, I, I wasn't a big fan of dogs because in the neighborhoods I lived in and played in, dogs weren't like dogs today. People didn't carry them around in fancy baskets and feed them treats. Dogs were on chains and they were basically for one purpose only, home protection. And so those dogs were angry. And some of the neighborhoods, like on Simpson Street in Hartford where my grandmother lived, We'd hop the fences to get through the backyard to get where we were going faster. Some of them poor dogs, the neighborhood was like black and West Indian. The dogs are mad. They've been eating rice and peas and stuff. Collard greens and cornbread dog mad. He's not getting what he wants. When you jump in that backyard, you look like a big side of steak. You know what the Bible says? We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Instantaneously, when you see that threat, cortisol is released. And this stress hormone then triggers the release of adrenaline. So what happens immediately is your pupils dilate. You need to see the dog, right? You don't need to read a newspaper right now, right? Blood is shunted away from your digestive tract to your big muscles. Who cares what you had for breakfast? You need to get away from this Cujo dog. Your heart rate increases so the blood moves faster. Your respiratory rate increases so you bring in more oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide faster. You get more blood sent to your brain by the raising of your blood pressure. All of this happens in the blink of an eye. And now you start running across that backyard and that dog can't believe how fast you're moving. You jump the fence in a single bound, land on the other side, take a few breaths, and what happens, God designed this is, the cortisol levels go back down, the adrenaline levels go back down, your body returns to normal, to homeostasis. The process of change is called allostasis to bring you back to homeostasis, which is when you're in balance. Now here's where it gets crazy. If you live a life where every day, all day, you're being chased by a dog, proverbially, you stay in that state of fight or flight. It means your blood pressure is always up. 
Your liver is always in a state called gluconeogenesis, always making sugar. Your, uh, your, the cortisol actually is the, is the hormone, the stress hormone, that actually causes your immune system to not become inflamed. It actually turns off the inf inflammation reaction of the immune system. That's what makes you actually sick. It's inflammation. But if you always have a high cortisol level, your immune system develops tolerance to it. And guess what? You can no longer regulate inflammation. And Americans are chronically inflamed. That's why COVID did so much damage in this country. Because COVID caused a cytokine storm, which is like hyper, super inflammation. And what else happens? Well, when you get stressed out like that, I showed you this the last time, stress spelled backwards is desserts. When you're chronically stressed, the, 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 the evil triad of salt, sugar, and fat, processed sugar, processed fats, oils, when you, those things, it tastes even better. A brownie will taste better with that scoop of vanilla ice cream when you're stressed out than if you had no stress. Nobody's going to say nothing, but you know I'm right. Because when you're stressed out, a lot of times, what do you do? You reach for that stuff. I've never seen somebody stressed out be like, man, I got to have a piece of broccoli. I need some kale. But what does this do? Well, it actually accelerates the aging process. We'll come back to this later in the series. But the telomeres at the tip of your chromosomes are like the, are like the plastic ends of your shoelaces. As you age, that piece begins to wear down. And that's literally what ages you and causes and predicts when you're going to die. Stress rapidly shortens the telomeres. And here I want to give you a, a bit of a, a spoiler alert. Our health message in its purest form is the only thing known to man that can restore it. That means that even if you live bad all your life and you decide I'm going to live right for Jesus and I'm going to try and do the best I can, I'm going to change some things around, you can literally reverse you see, we all say, well, we can reverse diabetes, we can reverse hypertension, we can reverse heart disease, heart disease. You can reverse aging. So, we know that stress does that. This is one that was on discrimination, racial bias, and telomere length in African American men. This study showed that those men who have real or perceived discrimination in their lives actually have much shorter telomeres. This is why the Bible says this Matthew 6 and verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the, for, for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You know, when I pray, I, I, I try and put embed uh, promises into my prayers according to the sanctuary uh, method of prayer. This is one of those promises you need to walk around with sometimes. And I'm guilty of this. Sometimes I'm thinking of something I got to do weeks from now and it's stressing me out. The problems of today are enough for today. Jesus said, don't worry about what's going to happen down the road. You never know where life is going to turn. My, one of my favorite Bible verses, another promise, 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a what? Sound mind. When you have the, see, and this is where, this is, this is where it eclipses and supersedes the science because the science can't really capture this in a study. When you trust God and you have him living in you and you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, something happens, something changes. The Holy Spirit begins to work. And instead of fear, you've got power. You've got love and your mind is sound. Jesus says it like this, come unto me all ye that labor. And are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. He's saying stop being stressed. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. Casting all your care upon him. For what? He cares for you. Why can I trust him the way I trust him? Because I know how much he loves me. You see, you know, the spirit of prophecy tells us that we should study the, the, the crucifixion of Christ. The end of his life. We should, uh, for one hour a day, we should meditate on it. And you know what happens when you meditate on what Christ did for you? You begin to understand more fully how much he loves you. The more you understand how much he loves you, the more you begin to trust him. Right? And then once you trust him, now like the three Hebrew boys, or like the woman who touched just the hem of his garment, you can leave your stress with him. You got a child that you're worried about that isn't living right? You can leave it with him because you know his love for you is greater 
uh, than anything on earth and his love for your child is greater than your love for your child. You can begin to trust him. First John 4 and 18, there is no fear in love. The perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. It, it drives you crazy. It keeps you up at night. It torments you. But he that has fear is not made perfect in love. And look at what, what John says. We love him. Why do we love him? Because he first loved us. I trust him because he showed me love before I knew who he was. That's what the Bible actually says. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We'll talk more about this later, but let me give you this diagram. Trust in God. How do you get to trust in God? One, Bible study. You've got to read the word. I tell people when I start studying with people, the first place I send them is the book of John. You need to see what kind of person Jesus was, right? You, want, you will keep the Sabbath once you know who you're keeping the Sabbath with. It's the book of John, Bible study, learn who Jesus is. A lot of times we spend all our time looking at our faults, looking at our shortcomings, reminding ourselves that we're not ready for his return. You will never get ready for his return looking at your shortcomings. To get ready for his return, you've got to look at his completeness, his faithfulness, his love, his endurance, and what he's done for you. Once you turn your eyes upon Jesus, you will naturally begin to become like Jesus. Prayer. Trust in God is about prayer. You got to pray. You got to talk to him, spend time with him. You got to have a church community. You need a body of believers to be around. And you've got to pray and ask for and live and dwell with the Holy Spirit because that's what transforms the character. Review and Herald, April 1901, page 11. We can serve God better in the vigor of health than in the palsy of disease. Therefore, we should cooperate with God in the care of our bodies. Love for God is essential for life and health. Did you get that? Faith in God is essential for health. In order to have perfect health, our hearts must be filled with love and hope and joy in the Lord. I'll finish with, by going back to the story of the woman who touched the hem of his garment. Mark 5, 34. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and behold of thy plague. Thy faith has made thee whole. You see, the person, in, in modern medicine, we, we basically look at people as, as emotional, mental, physical. We miss the spiritual. You will never be a whole person without that component. And trusting in God is where that component lies. She was made whole because of her faith. Here's what Ellen White says, Desire of Ages, page 344. Looking toward the woman, Jesus insisted on knowing who had touched him. Finding concealment vain, she came forward trembling and cast herself at his feet. With grateful tears, she told the story of her suffering and how she had found relief. Jesus gently said, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. He gave no opportunity for superstition to claim healing virtue for the mere act of touching his garments. It was not through the outward contact with him, but through the faith which took hold on his divine power that the cure was wrought. She says, the wandering crowd that pressed close about Christ realized no accession of vital power. But when the suffering woman put forth her hand to touch him, believing that she would be made whole, she felt the healing virtue. So in spiritual things, to talk of religion in a casual way, to pray without soul hunger and living faith avails nothing. A nominal faith in Christ, which, which accepts him merely as the savior of the world, can never bring healing to the soul. Did you get that? Just believing, just, you know, the Bible says the, the demons believe in tremble. We talked about that in prayer meeting. The demons believe in tremble. You, it's not just about believing. Ellen White says, the faith that is unto salvation is not a mere intellectual assent to the truth. He who waits for entire knowledge before he will exercise faith cannot receive blessing from God. It is not enough to believe about Christ. We must believe in him. The only faith that will benefit us is that which embraces him as a personal savior, which appropriates his merits to ourselves. Many hold faith as an opinion. There are a lot of people that say, this is just my opinion. This is the way I was raised. No, it must be a living thing inside of you. 
trusting God must be a part of you. It must be, it must actually uh, be alive in you. When Jeremiah was, 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 wanted to stop preaching, Jeremiah cries out, but it feels like fire. Shut up in my bones. This thing we have with Christ ought to be like fire. It should determine how we walk, think, dress, eat how we interact with others at work, how we are at school, everything about us ought to be different because Jesus is alive in us. She says, saving faith is a transaction by which those who receive Christ join themselves in covenant relation with God. Look at this. Genuine faith is life. A living faith means an increase of vigor, a confiding trust by which the soul becomes a conquering power. Listen, church, you have not just been called to be a Christian, sit in the pews and kind of slide your way into eternity. You've been called by the power of the Holy Spirit to be a conquering power. That means that when you step on the scene, the demons have to pay attention. Because when you go and you meet someone who's in trouble on an airplane or in a grocery store, when you say to them, listen, I'm going to pray for you, or even if you silently pray for them, if you hold their hand and begin to call on the name of God because you trust him, the, the, your faith is like a key that opens heaven's storehouse and blessing will pour out on that individual. You've been called, church, not just to be Christians, but to be powerful, active Christians who affect this world, change this world. And the health message is the vitality. E.E. E. Cleveland said it, one of my favorite preachers, some of y'all know who Pastor Cleveland was. E.E. E. Cleveland was my, one of my professors at Oakwood. He said something profound one day in our Dynamics of Christian Living class. He said, I'm a vegetarian. He said, I'm not a vegetarian. Um, he said, because me being a vegetarian makes me better than anyone else. He said, I don't believe I'm going to be saved because I'm a vegetarian. He said, I'm a vegetarian because I want to live as long as I can so I can preach this gospel to as many people as possible. The health message is the right arm of the gospel, not just because it's the way we can connect to the community, but it gives us the clarity of mind and the vigor of strength in order to reach people for Jesus Christ. And I can tell you, some of you are going through some difficult things. But I want you to know that the same Jesus that turned and found that woman in the crowd is the same Jesus in heaven today. Whatever it is you're going through, I challenge you this week to trust God, to reach out and grab hold the hem of his garment. And as Ellen White said, that is to grab him in a trusting way, to know that he can do what he has promised. And I pray for you this week that as you exercise faith in him, you'll see the changes in your life and in the lives of those who you're praying for. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his way. He's 
steps we will do, and where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to look at the, the healing power, the, the health-giving power that trusting in you gives. Lord, the world would have us be ignorant of this. The world would want us to think that we are fools for believing in you, for trusting your word, for calling on your name in time of trouble. But Father God, we have an assurance that you sit high on a throne, but you look real low. But Father God, your hand is upon each one of us. I am asking, Lord, this week for deliverance for someone in here. I'm asking this week, Lord, for answered prayers. I'm asking this week, Lord, for our characters to look more like the character of Christ than they did last week. That we, Lord, would live for you. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen. And amen. Mm -hmm. 